Walking to Sky, Chapter 1. <clears throat> I bought a bookshelf on Gumtree recently. Um, <laughs> um, I bought a bookshelf on Gumtree and it made me think about how our methods of communication have evolved you know in the old days if you wanted a bookshelf you'd go see Gerard the bookshelf guy because he was the dude in your tribe that made those sweet bookshelves he was reputable he was just cranking out shelves in his cave like a champ now we've got Gumtree any mad bastard can sell their shit on Gumtree. As a species, we're able to cope with intimately knowing and gossiping about around 150 other human beings. That's like the limit of our tribe. We can sustain that number and we can keep those relationships intact. That's what humans can handle. Any more than that, it starts to get messy. That's why we created abstract constructs like territories and deities to unite larger groups of humans under an imaginary common factor. And it works a treat because we only really converge en masse on special occasions. But I think social media is fucking all that up. You know, we can't cope with the thousands of people we're connected with on a daily basis. And as a result, we neglect our immediate 150. That's why I never get invited to parties anymore. It's not because I sit at the table and rant about veganism and fisting old ladies. It's because I'm not on Facebook and everyone just assumes you are. I am so behind on the births, deaths and marriages of my friends, I feel like the time traveller's wife every time I go to a party. Oh, you'd love our son. He's six now. Fucking didn't even know you were pregnant. <laughs> my manager thinks I'm doing my business a disservice because I'm not on Twitter or Instagram. He said to me, hopefully as these platforms become increasingly ubiquitous, your position will evolve. He may not understand that I see social media as emotional devolution. I'm trying to limit my contribution to the narcissism, insomnia and lack of empathy that media-related technology perpetuates. And people justify it and defend it because the constant stimulation of being connected to technology releases dopamine into your system. So given a choice between your phone and your creativity, you'll choose your phone because it feels nicer. And if my stance against those platforms means I sell less tickets, I just have to fucking deal with that. You know, I'll engage with my audience when they're in the room. If less of them know about it in the first place, I, I just don't really give a shit, you know. <laughs> and because I'm filming this, if you're watching this in a couple of years' time, Google me, find all my social media platforms and call me a fucking sellout. That'd be great. <laughs> Hashtag Randy's a fuckwit. So I'm on Gumtree and... Is this getting a bit self-indulgent? <laughs> no! I'm on Gumtree. Yeah, tell me, it's good. Anyway, I'm on Gumtree... <laughs> And I'm scanning through the list of bookshelves. We've got a real crack on here. Let's fucking get through this. Shit, am I right, folks? I'm um, on Gumtree. Uh, and I'm looking at the bookshelves. There's always a couple of random things in the list on Gumtree that are like the polar opposite of what you're actually searching for. It's like bookshelf, bookshelf, gramophone. Bookshelf, bookshelf, combine harvester. What the fuck? So I narrow it down to two bookshelves that work for me in terms of cost and geographical convenience. One seller is Kathy and the other is a guy called Morgan. I send the same text message to both of them. Hi, I saw you're out on Gumtree. Is your bookshelf still available? Within 10 minutes, I have two replies. Kathy says, sorry, it went this morning. I'm like, that's okay, Kathy. Sorry for giving you annoying voice in this retelling of the story. <laughs> Morgan's reply simply says, it was my wife's bookshelf. <laughs> yep. Okay, yep, cool. That's, that, yep, yep, that's cool. How do you reply to that? <laughs> Apart from the fact that it doesn't answer my question, the use of past tense in that sentence unnerves me slightly. Do I console him? I should probably just let it go at this point and search for another bookshelf, but he's like one suburb away, so I reply, is it still available? He writes back the letter Y. Just a Y? Is he asking me why I want to know if it's still available? Or is it Y for yes? And he's so in the throes of grief that he can't manage the E and the S. I assume it's Y for yes, and I reply, I'll take it. When's a good time to pick it up? No reply for eight minutes. And I assume it's because he's busy weeping for his lost wife. But when his reply comes through, I realise he spent that eight minutes writing his response because it's a fucking thesis. He must have felt so bad about only using a single consonant in his previous text that he's massively overcompensated in this one. 
He also felt that using punctuation was going a bit too far. So it's just one obscenely long sentence, which reads, you must come and pick up now. I only have a little time here at house. And I think it would be best if you come now and bring trailer or van because it's wide. And also there are stairs. So you will need to carry it downstairs. But I can help because I will be here. If you come now, you must park on street and walk up path. And if you ring bell, I will let you in and you can take shelf. I only accept cash and you must come now or I will sell it someone else. <laughs> Again, I should probably bail on this, but now I'm fascinated by Morgan and I simply must meet the man. So I text back, I'll be there in 15 minutes. He replies, okay, but spells it O-K-A-Y, which just fascinates me more. That it'll use four letters to spell a two letter word and only one to represent a three letter word. This guy's off the fucking chain. On the way there, I'm imagining what he's going to be like. You know, his pidgin English suggests ethnicity of some sort, but I don't want to racially profile him. Uh, maybe he's an old man who lost his wife recently and is not that good at texting. Or maybe, and I'm really hoping this is the case, Morgan is batshit crazy. So I get to the house and it's a fucking mansion. It's lo it looks like a doll's house though. It's like one of those classic facades with two stories, like little box windows and everything. And this is at odds with what I imagine Morgan's house to look like. I was thinking run down miner's cottage with a burnt out Commodore on the lawn, like a herd of cats lazing on the veranda, a troop of monkeys. Anyway, so I walk, I walk up to the, <laughs> I walk up path and ring bell and <laughs> I brace myself to meet some old dude in a smoking jacket with fishnet stockings, just sort of banging on an opium pipe with a butler polishing a goldfish in the background, like a pug dog wearing a fez sitting on a stool going, welcome to our beautiful room. But, um, and then this guy opens the door and I am thoroughly disappointed. He's a Caucasian man in his mid-thirties, dressed casually, hipster chic, bit of stubble, glasses with cool frames, expensive watch. I immediately think architect, but the house is too cheesy for that. But definitely a designer of some kind, maybe a graphic designer. He's too skinny for manual labour, too hip for the public sector. But this can't be Morgan, because Morgan's text messages would suggest that he's not that technically savvy. But then he opens his mouth and says, Randy? Yes, I reply. Morgan, he says, and the plot thickens. <laughs> he shakes my hand, invites me in, and 20 minutes later, he will be performing one of the most aggressively violent acts I have ever witnessed, and I will be speeding away in my car, bleeding from the head. Here's how this shit went down. <laughs> he leads me down the hall, and I notice two things immediately. It is a house in the throes of renovation. Nothing too extreme, but there's drop sheets on the furniture, but freshly painted walls, new bathtubs sitting wrapped in plastic in the hall, ready for installation. Someone's doing some work on this house. The second thing I notice is a wedding photo on the second landing on the way up the stairs, featuring a cleanly shaven Morgan and a very attractive bride. Very much in love. The frame is very much on the floor and the glass in the frame is very much smashed. She's not dead, she's left him. The plot thickens a bit more! And as he kicks the photo unceremoniously to one side on the way up to the second floor, I really want to pry into Morgan's life and ask a bunch of really inappropriate questions. But he's clearly a broken man. He's got this terrible air of sadness around him, so I don't want to intrude, you know? But it turns out I don't have to because he immediately begins oversharing and tells me the entire story. Oh, thank you, Morgan. I will hang off your every word and then retell your tragic tale in a Lithuanian ballroom. <laughs> he is a graphic designer. Yes, and he's really good at it. He works for massive corporations doing like large rebranding campaigns, reinventing the public face of multinational companies, basically. You know, like Virgin Airlines, ANZ Bank, that sort of shit. And he's like the hip gun for hire that kind of taps your stodgy business into the public zeitgeist. Four years ago, he met a client who wanted to rebrand her florist business and he did such a good job, she married him. And as far as he was concerned, he was very happily married until a few months ago, he had a massive presentation to do for a prospective client, but he got stuck in Dubai due to a flight cancellation. So being the incredibly tech-savvy guy that he is, despite his baffling text message style, he organises to have a Skype chat 
with these with like a boardroom in Sydney. So he's sitting there in his hotel in Dubai and he's pitching the rebranding to this boardroom of suits in Sydney. And it's going very well until about half... Oh, she's my... Bye! <laughs> this story's going for too fucking long. Um, anyway, he's pitching the story. It's just getting to the good bit. Um, uh, that was Jess, gone for the tunnel. I am... Um, <laughs> Anyway, anyway, he's pitching, he's pitching the story. Like, he's sitting there, he's pitching, he's pitching this, this rebranding to this boardroom in Sydney, and he realises that a file he needs is on the desktop of his home computer in his own home office. And so he decides to show off a bit in front of his clients by live sharing the screen of his home computer on the Skype chat. He knows how to do that. He can remotely control his computer over the internet from wherever he is and share the screen. It's not new technology, but he makes it sound impressive. And they're all watching keenly as he clicks a few windows, brings it up, and immediately shares the home screen of his office computer with a boardroom of Sydney suits looking at a massive screen. And what Morgan doesn't realise is his wife has been using the photo booth app on his computer to take naked pictures of herself and it's still open on the desktop. Embarrassing. It's very embarrassing. They're quite provocative photographs. And those of you who are familiar with the photo booth app will know that it accesses the built-in camera on your computer. Then with a click of the button, you capture the shot of yourself looking at the screen. And if you leave the program open, the camera remains open witnessing anything that may be happening directly in front of the screen, such as your wife in your home office, fucking your best mate. Oh, no, Morgan! Say it isn't so, Morgan! It is so. No, Morgan! Yes, it is so. Oh! It's at this part of the story that Morgan tells me she's keeping the house, his former best mate is moving in, and while they're out for the day shopping for fittings, he must suffer the indignity of moving his shit out and selling the crap she doesn't want on fucking Gumtree. Oh, Morgan, it hurts me in the face! And he's telling me this, and he's like... He starts to choke up and, and he can't hold in the tears and he starts crying and I don't blame him, you know. I feel really awful for him. He seems like a really nice guy. But I'm holding the full weight of a bookshelf halfway down a staircase and Morgan is the only thing stopping the bookshelf from tumbling down the stairs, taking me with it. So I'm like, Morgan, little help, buddy. He's like, oh, sorry. And he manages to pull himself together for about 30 seconds, and then he just fucking lets go. I fall backwards, the bookshelf literally tumbles over my head, almost scalping me, the top of it just misses crushing my fucking face in, like a skylight onto Hemingway. The base of it flicks up and smashes a chandelier hanging from the roof, showering me in broken glass. I'm laying on the stairs and go, make it stop! The bookshelf turns end over end down the staircase and goes right through the freshly painted wall at the bottom of the stairs, right through the wall, bringing a 60-inch plasma TV screen mounted on the other side of the wall down onto a glass coffee table. It's like, bang, 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 fucking smash, boom, bang, fucking smash. It was very dramatic. I managed to get out of this with like a tiny bruise on the back of my leg from where I landed on the stairs and like a tiny cut on my head, which is pissing blood for some reason. Little cut, pissing blood. Apart from that, I'm fine. Morgan, however, is not fine. He's the opposite of fine. It totally changes him. It's like he's shocked back into reality. The sadness just goes away in an instant and he starts pissing himself laughing, just hysterically. Oh my God, did you see that? Oh my God, look at the wall. <laughs> like crying with laughter, he can't control himself. He's just losing it. I join in because fucking, I'm afraid he's gonna stab me in the face. <laughs> He helps me up, laughing maniacally the whole time. We extract the bookshelf from the rubble. The bookshelf, miraculously, has no visible signs of having just smashed through a wall and destroyed a two and a half thousand dollar television. We carry it out to my trailer. He's still laughing the whole time. And he's in such a good mood now that he lets me have the bookshelf for free. Morgan! Yeah. And that's where the story should end. But there was something about the shelf smashing through the wall that affected Morgan 
and he is now hungry for more destruction. So as I begin tying the bookshelf down to the trailer, Morgan casually wanders over to like a freestanding mailbox on the front lawn and just starts trying to wrench it out of the ground. Just like leaning on it, just going, mm, 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 mm. like, dude, are you cool? He's like, yeah, man, everything's good. Having a good time. He wrenches it out of the ground, whereupon he wields it like a fucking battle axe and just starts hacking into the rose bushes in the front lawn. Just smashing up the lavender, just trashing the garden. I'm like, uh, Morgan, maybe, maybe you want to chill out for a bit. And he looks at me like Jack Nicholson chasing Shelley Duval up the stairs in The Shining and says, mind your own fucking business. Yep, cool man, no worries. Yep, sweet ass. Now, I like tying knots. I enjoy them. Uh, I'm good at knots. If, I, if I'm tying a knot, I'll take my time with the knot. If I tie something down, I want it to stay there. But as Morgan walked up the driveway, nonchalantly rolled up the garage door and put the mailbox through the windscreen of an Audi, I must admit I kind of rushed the knot tying job. And I was just going to drive away and I'm like, should I call the cops? I really wanted to intervene. Morgan seemed like a nice guy. I wanted to try to talk him out of destroying the whole house. So I started to tentatively make my way up to the garage, but I couldn't see him in there, right? And there's like a door, I could see through a door into a staircase into the house. And I was like, Morgan, Morgan, like I'm calling a cat for dinner, Morgan. And then an armchair came flying out of an upstairs window and smashed on the lawn behind me. And I thought I should probably just leave Morgan to it. <laughs> the beautiful footnote to this story is as I sped away with blood still dripping down my forehead, I rounded the corner at the end of his street and the bookshelf flew off the trailer and smashed against the guardrail. Just exploded in a shower of wood and badly tied knots. So I just fucking left it there. <laughs> like a little breadcrumb for Morgan's ex-wife to find on her way back to her destroyed gingerbread house. And that is why I no longer shop on Gumtree, my friends. <sighs> <laughs> oh, you know my favourite bit of that story? I made it up. <laughs> yeah, it's not true. None of that happened. There is no Morgan. Oh, oh, it's unsatisfying, isn't it? Oh, you bastard. We believed in Morgan. We saw his face in our heads. <laughs>